Hello, everyone, and thanks for having me present some ideas and topics today on creative technology and design in public spaces. My name is Braden Webb, and I'm an experienced director and designer. Currently, I'm working at The Mill in Chicago as a creative director, developing content for, for creative te technology. I have about 19 years experience and a lot of cross-disciplinary work that happens at the intersection of design, art, and technology. I've created media for a vast range of lobby art installations, museum exhibitions, interactive experiences, and live show visuals for world-class musicians. And the title of my talk today is Digital Design in Public Spaces. So first, I'd like to start by showing a few things that I have a genuine curiosity for. Technology and art. Specifically, though, through math, physics, nature, patterns, algorithms, and data visualizations. Each one of these tiles has a story of some kind, but just to describe some of the things that you're seeing, I'm drawing shapes with my eyes using eye tracking, visualizing motion paths from live footage, touching responsive virtual objects, exploring the shape and volume of color using mathematical equations, and controlling sound vibrations with your hands. Some of these things are about patterns and trying to create a deeper sense of life and what can go beyond a basic noise function uh, and operate under the hood slightly more intelligent way and offer uh, uh, some greater sense of um, complexity. Machine learning and AI are, are able to make completely unique decisions and sometimes that's unpredictable. Uh, these things all go under the microscope for study and for incorporation into future projects. Uh, I figure if these things genuinely excite me, they'll also excite others. And I think that's one of the first contradictions as a creator is that you're also the member of the audience. And it may seem obvious, but you need to be making things that you like. Uh, and that's also kind of the point, I think, as creators to somehow make our subjective experiences more universal. And a lot of times for me, it does tend to uh, steer towards the more abstract qualities of color, shape, and pattern um, and a lot of the reason for that is I think it ends up providing more room for the audience to come in and uh, bring their own response to those um, to those um, to those visuals, and it can evoke a more emotional response. And humans are really good at pattern recognizing uh, recognizing patterns and making connections between things. So before diving into some more work, I'd like to touch on a few pieces of inspiration. May Jemison says, the difference between science and the arts is not that they're different sides of the same coin, but rather they're manifestations of the same thing. The arts and sciences are avatars of human creativity. And it's really that last bit, the avatars of human creativity that struck me. It's such a cool way to describe th something, but it's also a little bit strange and, and elusive. And it, it might not be something that we'd expect from an engineer or an astronaut. I think we're often surprised by how a lot of the deep and influential thinkers of our time end up having, having a scientific background. But I relate to this not as much as having a right brain or a left brain, but really it's about your whole brain, or rather your whole body and spirit to, to really uh, dive deep and figure out where the well of emotions are and to bring your creativity and explore the world. It's about what are you bringing into this world in the first place and why, and what are your tools to do that? Science, technology, art, dance, poetry, music, it's all, it's all useful, it's all fair game, and it doesn't really stop there. So regardless of what you do, there's a human thread that can connect it all. And these are some of the artists here who have inspired me growing up. Da Vinci, Escher, Pollock, and Rothko. Design can be said to solve a problem, but art is there to provoke a thought or maybe to spark a conversation. In each one of these artists, there's some idea or something that I've taken from them. With Da Vinci, it's the inventiveness of his work. And probably the poster artist for blending science and art, which historically weren't treated as two separate trades, but as one. So in order to even be an artist in the first place, you had to have a good foundation in physical sciences to make the, the paint, the pigment, the tools, the canvases, all that 
And perspective rendering itself was a kind of pre-technology tool along with the camera obscura. So in a way, I see that creative technology has been with us for a very long time. And it's kind of a curious when we just did start to think of these as two separate things. But from Escher, there's something that I also like about the mathematical patterns and illusions of space and time, and perhaps blending of a, a little bit more of a designer's mindset with, with art. From Pollock, it's the chaotic nature of creation through gravity in his splatter paintings. And I use the two terms, chaos and gravity, somewhat liberally, but they're also physics terms, which, which you can use to describe the work, but somehow this work has defied being classified as scientific imagery. Um, you could compare this painting to maybe an early universe radiation pattern or fluid dynamics, and, and, and you could see definitely a lot of similar forces at work. Um, and Damien Hirst is a more modern example of that, who also uses similar techniques with his spin paintings. And finally, from Rothko, for me here, it's all about the simple confidence in color. In color, we usually think maybe in the artist palette type of sense of, of pigment from a tube or um, uh, canvas, but I also think of color in the physics sense as light or as a vibrational wavelength, and specifically the emotional qualities of, of a light, um, particularly in the sky. And I think it's a brave thing to go out there with, with, in, in some of these cases with a minimal canvas and to tell a story. And people might say that there's no technique to it, or maybe my kid could do that. And well, it might be true, but um, you know, technically it is maybe just paint splattered on a canvas. But really the idea is that you have to be the first one to do it and, and sort of have an audience accept it to be, to be relevant. So it, it's the kind of thing that only makes sense looking back because of hindsight. And it's probably a more difficult thing to do at the time. So the problem is, as soon as you're there, it's time to move on to explore something new. Which brings us to creative technology. Uh, and Henry Ford was credited as saying, people don't know what they want. If I asked them, they'd say a faster horse. So I think we're talking about innovation here, essentially. And I think it's more about just then evolving the tools. It's about evolving the where and the why and how we place the content in the world to tell stories. We've seen a lot of successful events this last year that crossed borders and boundaries to blend things, specifically with music and gaming. Um, the hybrid events of Travis Scott Fortnite event comes to mind. Um, and I'll be referring a lot more to borders and boundaries and classifications because I think that's the useful edge of, of where a lot of the inspiring work or innovation happens. And to use another example from my past, this might date me a little bit, but my first internship was with MK12 in Kansas City. And there's a similar term kicking around at the time motion graphics and um you know it, it wasn't it, it, it was mk12 stylistic approach to it and the ubiquity and access of new tools coming out for adobe after effects and maya that really allowed them to create exciting things that people had never seen before and now 20 years later motion graphics it's still kind of evolving um there there's still new forms uh, illustration styles are, that are emerging and exciting um but there's also something very similar to the term motion graphics and creative technology in that um, they're both made up of two simple words, things that we think we know and we put them together. And somehow when we try to then explain it, it eludes us a little bit. And so I think this is one of the magic things about um, the industry is, is when there's something new, uh, it's often how we approach it, combining two terms or two concepts. So I think innovation is difficult work though. There's all sorts of ways that technology can be used to make things faster and cheaper, to get from point A to point B, to sidestep the sometimes time consuming or rendering process, to create cheaper VFX or to process large volumes or databases of information. And there's trade-offs at times. You might, uh, you might be able to do something faster, but it might also come with the uh, complexities or the expense of having to rewrite a whole new pipeline or process to do it. And these, these are good things and they're worthy to pursue, but I also think the important question is to ask why and to what end? Uh, what is the pursuit of all this stuff? Are we just going to build a faster horse or are we looking to build a new rocket ship and explore different worlds? So I think you know, fundamentally adapting and changing the industry and asking new exciting questions is um, something that excites me. Like in what ways can we use technology and unique spaces that create a more authentic connection? And how do we utilize interactivity and technology to excite audiences and get them to spend more time with us? And more importantly, where is even the frame to begin with? As screens become smaller or uh, hidden, 
uh, different technology makes them integrate into our environments, it becomes uh, harder and harder to, to tell where the screen ends and where, <laughs> or where it starts and where it ends, rather. Um, and this is sort of how I see creative technology, with the lens of looking outward at the audience. And the trouble is it's always on the run, like a wild horse, evolving, changing, and adapting. So some of the technology concepts, and, and these are some of the things that I think about when I think about creative technology. Um, certainly new things will be added to the list and others dropped off as they, they become more commonplace. Machine learning, for example, is already in the latest version of Photoshop. You can man manipulate photos of people and use a simple slider to make them look older or younger. And then there's also things like GPU rendering with Redshift. And maybe it's not quite real time, but it's still very fast. And maybe one time it'll cross that threshold. These are the industry innovations, things that everyone will have access to because they are standard and built right into the software. But there'll always be at times uh, that you need to pop under the hood, so to speak, and customize things. And this is where a lot of the innovation comes in. One, some, one such example of this is the ultra fast motion tracking combined with projection mapping onto live dancers. It's possible to do this at the standard 24, 30, or 60 frames per second, but it really needs to be much faster to, to do it convincingly and to do it in real life. So uh, this is a chart here from Kirby Ferguson, and he says that everything is a remix. And the basic process or procedural elements to do this are to copy, transform, and combine. And sometimes when you do this, you stumble on something that's new and stimulation clicks, and it just feels fresh, just feels right. So um, this is also one of the ways I think that we use to learn and creativity. we use creativity to explore our world. But it's also how we play. And so when I think of the term creative technology, I also think uh, of play. And and maybe uh, innovation is also uh, related to that and, and innovation you need to play in order to be, in, uh, to be innovative. But that doesn't mean that the play isn't serious, but rather I'm very serious about the need to play. And yeah, just to give a little bit of context and to back up even further and understand how I got here and develop some of these thoughts and ideas and points of view, and a little bit of context for some of the experiences I've created. I started out in fine arts, creating installation, performance, and interactive arts. I built this installation in collaboration with Benjamin Thorpe back in 2002. The table engages a musical conversation between two people. Uh, each person can move a conductive metal cup along the table, and there's a chest-like board structure which controls a MIDI device, and that alters a real-time soundtrack. The four shiny uh, things hanging in the right picture, those are the speakers. So. It demonstrates a few characteristics of things that I've come to embrace, and it's collaborative and inspires the spirit of play. The tech is novel and custom. It's built for purpose. It is a MIDI device, but it's also, but it's not really an instrument, but maybe it kind of also is, and, and that's kind of the thing. It's hard to define, and I think that's also a bit of the point, is that the, the interesting thing about the borders and classifications of things is when you can kind of bend them and sort of um, make them something that they're maybe not inherently. Um, these are the things that provoke the most discussion. Where things uh, exist that cannot be fully described, it sparks curiosity. It's also a super low barrier to entry for the audience. There's no phones or devices or even computers that are needed. It's something that anyone can do and everything's provided. You don't have to worry if it's iPhone 12 or 10 or Android or whatever. Um, just works. It's interactive and non-linear. So there's no start or end to it. You jump in and you, par you begin participating right away. It doesn't do anything without you engaging it. So one of my first well-known projects was for the ISAM World Tour in 2011 for Amon Tobin, produced by Leviathan and V-Squared Labs. I learned a lot about audiences. And then doing a few more concert visuals, uh, it taught me how brands might use some similar approaches and what they're trying to do. For the best experiences, audiences must be considered first. You have to look at the problem a little bit inverted, flipped around, upside down, Experiences are something that should be given freely without the expectation of any ROI, conversion, or sale. It's, it's about building a meaningful connection to the brand and to others that offer something of value to the audience. And the artistic value has to be considered in that as well. We're now starting to call this return on experience. And if you do it right and authentically, people will see it and people will feel it. Authenticity and transparency are two 
big topics that are trending right now in branding and marketing. And I would also add now privacy. So here are some examples of digital work and physical spaces. The top two are ones that I've done with Leviathan and the bottom row are some other notable examples from, from studios, Digital Kitchen, Hush, and Moment Factory. And what you'll see in these examples is a way that the digital design plays a huge role in the architecture design. And it starts to border on what you might call interior design. But uh, these are light emitting screens. And so it's a way that spaces can now tell better or more complex stories with media. In the upper left for 150 Media Stream, which is a permanent installation in a commercial building, uh, the example shown there is a real-time generative remix of the city. It's a GLSL shader and pulls imagery into a real-time system and quantitizes uh, the patterns to a vertical structure that fits the unique LED canvas. And what's great about this is that it works with anything. And you can put any image in there, and it'll do it, and it'll look great. And for a content system to work in this way, it's a very challenging thing to do. If you remember the Rothko image shown from earlier, you can definitely see some influence, uh, artistic you know, reference to, to um, abstraction of color and light. But it's also about patternation, too. About 12 unique pieces were created for that canvas at 16K resolution. Um, and it's really meant to, to be content for 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, but now the canvas is open for future collaboration with other artists and designers. And that's, that's a great thing, too, that we can all contribute. The opening sourcing of content platforms and technology makes them more democratic and provides an opportunity to hear diverse voices from the community that you might not otherwise hear. Because some of these investments, they take considerable effort um, and partnerships with, architecture, with architects and fabricators and, and the cost, too. So it needs to last for several years, and there needs to be a way to, to build community uh, and, and content around these installations. Um, yeah, so then the next, the next example there for Dolby Laboratories um, in, in the upper right, it's similarly another, another open source canvas for content creators. For me, uh, it's all about the Jackson Pollock uh, inspiration here. The complex particle animation is derived from taking uh, the color of artworks and using a scientific equation to extrapolate the color volume and create these chaos and the uh, stringy patterns. The equation was translated from a uh, color volume HDR white paper from Dolby scientist Robin Atkins, who's the director of Applied Vision Science Group at Dolby. That particular canvas renders in real time at 9K resolution, and it can go on indefinitely creating colors and patterns. It is art, but it's also real science too. And one of the best compliments that I've received from, from an audience member is some, someone said that it reminded them of the feeling they get while they meditate, which I thought was just you know, pretty awesome. And I hadn't really thought of that to begin with, but it, it's sort of one of the qualities of things that, that I look to do. Um, and for someone to want to spend time in the Dolby headquarters in, in this way and, and to associate the work with meditation, I think it's a pretty powerful thing. And Dolby also has uh, a lot of new technology that they're recently focusing on brainwave stimulations and perception of color and measuring the emotional response. So this actually fits perfectly into their brand story. It's instead of a return on investment, it's a return on experience. And you know, one of the things that I look for is what's the value of having the audience spend time with your brand. And this is where having direct to brand partnerships becomes an integral part of the production process. But with digital spaces, it's also about making them interactive. On the top row, there's a few things that I've made uh, with Leviathan that uh, are all about getting audiences to be a part of the digital, to create more tactile experiences of it, to be inside the story themselves. Uh, the top right image there is a Pepper's Ghost holographic effect where you can stand in front of a digital mirror and in, in the Vitruvian man pose, and that's a throwback to the Da Vinci <laughs> art reference, um, but you can have yourself measured for the proportions and learn about um, numbers in nature. Uh, this was a custom installation created years ago, but now we're actually seeing these digital mirror screen devices showing up in some home workout equipment. So with creative technology, sometimes the important thing is to hide the tech in a way that you don't even see the screen anymore. Yeah, so I think what's significant about this stuff is that it's real. It's not fixed or, or it's not fixed in post or faked. It, it has to really work in front of your eyes and it, and it becomes a real life visual effect. 
So I've combined a few other examples here on the lower row, one from the mill using Brave Wave scanning device that drives the screen content for Acor hotels. In the, in, in the bottom center, there's an interesting installation by Goodby, Silverstein, and partners that transcends both space and time using deep fakes at the Dali Museum. This installation brings back Salvador Dali to talk about his art and gives visitors a unique point of view that they've never had. And at the end, Dali will take a selfie with you and send it to you via text message. And finally, the other installation on the lower right there is for HBO's Game of Thrones by Red Paper Heart. Uh, when you swing a giant sword to create custom artworks uh, by the show's iconography, you become part of, uh, you become active in the experience. So I think in the near future, it's understood people might not like touch screens, but there's all sorts of ways of using computer vision and tracking systems for no touch tech, uh, interactivity. And these things all show us what it's like to play with digital technology. But once again, the focus is on the audiences and meaningful experiences offer something without the expectation of anything in return. And modern marketing is about getting an audience to spend time with your brand. Experienced designers are at the forefront of this challenge. It's a gift, or it should be. Time and attention are our most precious resources. They're limited and they will run out. So when we're asking for people's time, we should really think about that and take it seriously. Audiences are keen to know when they're being advertised to with ad blocker and skip ad features built right in. People are just looking to skip to the content they care about. So I'm, in a way, I'm asking what are ways that we can transform our thinking to be more thoughtful and offer the right things? To go deeper and offer an authentic connection where people actually want to experience your brand or be in your space. And the tricky thing is obviously as creators, we wanna be paid for our work and someone has to pay us for that too. But if done in the right way, with the audience in mind, it can generate its own form of currency where it's sort of a closed loop and everything and everybody gets something that they want. So here are some of the qualities of, of, of things that I've tried to achieve in one way or another with the work that I produce. That is, I hope for the work to wish people well, to be thought provoking and to create a sense of belonging. Uh, the feeling of fulfillment and for inspiration and meditation or to spark curiosity and the spirit of play. Education, and finally, for excitement. These things here in the list, it's really hard to do, but creative technology is one part of that puzzle. And if you create these things with the audience, you've created a return on their experience. And they'll thank you for it and share the work and talk about it. So here's a few things that are also being done right now at the mill in the areas of experience design. And what I like about a lot of this work is that it exists in real and virtual spaces. It's people interacting with the digital technology and experiencing light in unique and in interesting ways. And innovation plays a huge part of this, but the tricky thing is to sometimes know how to innovate. And there's a little bit of a wild spirit to it, and it just it, it, there may not only be one way to do it. So these examples all span a few different areas from XR to software, hardware uh, developments to digital design and physical spaces, and also AR. In order to create this work, you need to have certain attributes such as adaptability, patience, spatial awareness, and especially in unknown or uncertain environments. These are all the things that we'll draw upon in times of challenge when facing something new, because a lot of times the technology is so new, there isn't a prescribed or documented way of working with it. I don't think that anyone would have seen a remote 5G tattooing robot coming, but it tells a great story. And a lot of the situations, what we're trying to do with technology is novel and new uses sometimes involve stitching together smaller pieces that play together nicely. Kind of back to what Kirby was saying about the elements of creativity. These experiences all ask, how does it feel to be activated uh, technologically through your body or to be disembodied or how to be virtual and transcend space? Neil deGrasse Tyson had this to say about it. Uh, the area of, as the area of our knowledge grows, so too does the perimeter of our ignorance. And this is really kind of a terrifying thought, actually. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's a universal constant, but it seems as though the more we learn, the more we have to learn. And there's always a need to go out into unknown spaces and territories. Uh, if it's not a universal con constant, at the very least, I think it's a human one. And but, but given that, given, given that this may be true, I think there's, there's sort of an ability to relax into that feeling of infinite space and to use that to relocate yourself and your surroundings. 
And speaking of that, it's images like these that really changed our collective consciousness and made us think differently about how interconnected we really are. And I believe the role of geography will be one of the big important questions in the future, especially with so, so many of us working virtually now. We've learned a lot about that in the past year, connecting, remotely working, uh, all the ways of communicating and tools for transcending space and time. And does it even matter anymore? Um, I think it's going to be difficult to answer that, but there are many ways that I think that travel and space and geography benefits and enriches our lives. I think about some of the important things of identity and culture, and it seems to be almost uh, inseparable from geography. It's one of the reasons why we go out into this world and seek something new, for new sights and scenes to better understand ourselves. And as we go outward, ironically, it's really a journey inward. And it's one of the only ways that I think culture and history has been created. It's difficult to know what, what we're gonna do with that. So it's been said that the city itself is a collective memory and like memory associates with objects and places. And this place, the Mart, has a special place in my heart as well as for the city of Chicago. Not only can you go on a riverboat tour and explore all the different ar architectural sites and skyscrapers, uh, they'll talk about the significance of this building and the Art Deco style and how it fits into the uh, design of, 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 of the city itself. It's also the site where they'll show a nightly projection mapping show. And experience design is one of the things that meets you out in all of these unique spaces. It heavily relies on contextualism. It's becoming harder and harder to define exactly where the frame is. So yeah, in the future, maybe there's going to, going to be these digital layers which can accumulate and store information and, and recall these memories that are organized by our geography or, or space. I don't know, who knows? And this is how the merchandise mart looks back in 1969. It's hard to tell, but it's the same building on the previous page. So what's amazing about this, and you'll see in just a minute, is the Mart has had a history of lighting shows on their building facade. And this is one of the ways that history and culture and cities reinvent themselves is through reimagination, creative technology, modernizing and remixing of the shared past. And this is how the Mart looks today. Today, the Mart is used to hold a projection mapping show. Residents and tourists flock to see it, and it's a wonderful site of shared collective experience within the city. Obscura Digital created the original installation, but now it's open to future commission from future artists and studios to create works on this canvas. And like I said before, I think this type of thing is great where an installation is, is a, a tech, the, te the technology is installed once, uh, but then it's open and it's the ability to have seasonal content refresh and a continuous evolution of, um, of digital content. And we've got two more shows that are going to be planned for this canvas next year. But on this hype, on this example, it's hyper local and hyper specific one in that geography very much matters. Um, <clears throat> th this project is recently completed uh, in Chicago at the mill. Uh, for the Joffrey Ballet in collaboration with Art on the Mart. And if you know anything about the Joffrey's version of the Nutcracker, you'll know that they have reimagined the story and time and place. It is set at the Columbian Exposition, 1893. So this building itself is a historic building, yet it's using new projection technology to retell an old story, but one that the Joffrey has reimagined recently. So it's a bit of a rust Russian nested doll kind of thing. And in order to get works like this, they're highly referential and contextual, and that's part of what gives it the meaning. It's a good show for all, all audiences and all ages, and many people in Chicago go and see the theater version of the Nutcracker every year. So in the future, I think there's a, well, even today, I should say, <laughs> there's a lot of talk about holograms and how, how they're going to, how they're coming, how we're gonna do it. Um, what are the technologies that we're gonna use? AR, VR, XR, light field, headsets or no headsets. Uh, there's a lot of things being tossed around. And even recently I heard the term DR for diminishing reality, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, as screens become too pervasive, we'll need a, an ability to escape from beaming pixels directly onto our eyeballs. But I like to think of projection mapping as one of the original forms of augmenting reality. And as a holographic effect, it still works pretty well. 
And one of the most attractive things about this is the low barrier to entry. It's you don't need any devices. Uh, you can you can just show up. You don't even need a phone. So in the future, I think we have to be aware of of what are the platforms and what are the ways which we make the technology accessible to the audience. And on this canvas, we're transforming the massive building into a giant theater. When seen from a distance, it really becomes a striking expression of physical light within the city. The dancers are larger than life and a bit heroic and placed on the building. When, but the dancers poses themselves, they're actually specifically designed and manipulated with the architecture in mind. You can see the magician's character's arms outstretched in the center to hold up, uh, referencing and contextualizing the building's uh, architecture, the, the columns there. But another thing that I love about this is the ability to transform entire buildings as a kind of pixel camouflage. The massive building turns into a giant Christmas tree to celebrate the season. And I think we have to be careful, though, that we don't turn every surface into a TV, but we embrace the more artful and abstract sides when possible for a more open-ended discussion that can leave room for the audience to draw their own conclusions and to come into the conversation. And digital light ends up being one of the newest material in architectural design. It does sort of end up being a screen, but it's also uh, a good break from our usual devices and Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and TikTok and all the other apps that are vying for our attention. But one more word about this production. It was very much in danger of not happen, happen, happening. The Joffrey Ballet had to cancel their seasonal live production of The Nutcracker, and we were, we were about to cancel this production as well due to the pandemic. It was incredibly sad. However, there's triumph in this story that obviously, seeing the pictures, it did happen. And this became our city's Nutcracker for the year. And it's been a way to stay even more relevant and reach a wider audience through outdoor installations and live streaming that can be viewed from a safe distance. An experienced design is kind of like this. It's a pretty sneaky thing. It finds all these cracks and corners and ways to get into our world and touch our space in unique and interesting ways. So for all the people out there who are dreaming to do physical installations, there is hope that these types of projects can still happen. And we may even also see a rebound effect where this type of thing becomes more wildly popular in the near future. The people of Chicago, they really needed this. You could just feel it in, in the air on opening night. Uh, I remember it well. Uh, it was a, about nine months of being indoors and people needed to connect with one another. And as a creator, I also needed to connect to an audience. And the Joffrey's dancers, they too, they also needed to connect to their community. And most importantly, the people needed art. So this production became all these things at once, a very interrelated and interwoven experience where um, it really becomes a way of, of designing experiences within our cities and tell stories. And let's take a look at uh, some of the behind the scenes for this production. So one of the things that you might note here is there wasn't a lot of fancy new tech in the actual production of this, but rather it's more the application that's significant here and, and that it's in a different environment, which makes it significant. And there are certainly complexities of projected color and contrast and designing for motion, 
uh, on a building at this size and scale. And their challenges with mapping features of the building uh, and, and the lights and the, and the windows and, and how all of that works. Um, but it's, it's really, you know, at the heart, it's still just another way of storytelling that makes this type of thing stand out. So a great piece, and if you want to see it, you're going to have to come to Chicago. And I think they'll play it next year and potentially year after seasonally. So with that, as we move through the world and there's more screens in our pockets and around us, it's important as experienced designers to be utilizing our creative and artistic efforts for the audience's benefit. And remember, the audience always comes first. And finally, I want to thank you for your time as an audience. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, check out some of the links below and some of the, see some of the other work that I've done uh, or that the mill has done in this area. Uh, and reach out and let me know what you think. All right, thanks. Until next time.